Well, thank you everybody for coming. You know, it's been a long day already, but we're gonna have a lot of fun here in this next hour. My name is Chris Haleua, and we'll be talking about data storytelling today. And we're going through a lot of content. Um, so in case you want to get the slides and you don't want to chase me down after, this red link that you can see, tiny.cc slash data storytelling, has all the slides. Hopefully there's something in there that either you can use or that your team can use to remind you of the symposium today and some of the topics that we'll discuss. Uh, but also come grab me in case you have any other specific questions. But uh, you know, let's just imagine that it's you know, 9 p.m. at my house and my sons say to me, Dad, it's bedtime. Will you please show me that beautiful normal distribution visualization you made of bedtimes in the neighborhood? That was such a beautiful chart. That's not what they say. They say, let's read Darth Vader and Son. And I can only convince them to go to bed if they believe their metachlorian count correlates with their sleep hours per night. And so uh, stories are what we're wired for. And I think that whether you're my little sons or whether you're my boss, it's something that we all respond to and something we can all take advantage of a little bit better. Unfortunately, of these three keys of data storytelling, usually we're only good at one, maybe two of them. And the problem with that is that when we're only good at one or two of these keys in data and visuals and narrative, we can usually instruct and teach, or we can inspire and enlighten, or we can entertain or engage, but that's usually not what we're going for. Usually we're going for that combination of all three that really helps our organization to go through change and helps gives our customer the type of experience where they're gonna wanna convert. And so that's what today's message is about, combining those three keys together in a way that improves your relationship with your team and gives your customers a better experience. So I loved how Michael Donnelly went through st uh, storytelling in his session, talked about how it's always been a part of how we interact as humans and how it's very important because it helps us to remember the most important lessons that we've gone through. So we're gonna watch a quick video here uh, from a woman named Jennifer Aker that talks about some of the other reasons why we need data story. Once upon a time, information was scarce. So we made decisions based on the advice of experts, using them as north stars for insights. Now, thanks to the internet, we can ourselves try and find our own answers to questions that plague us and find information to make informed decisions. But instead of finding clear answers, we often find noise. We're living in a world where we have too much information. And because of that, we're even more susceptible to great story. It's what helps us decide what to believe in. Stories are important because they're meaningful, and they're meaningful because they're memorable, impactful, and they personally connect. First, let's talk oh, there, That video goes on, definitely worth uh, checking out after the session, but um, she reminds us that in a world with so much information and data and noise, story is what helps us remember what to believe in. And so Stephen View also talked about how it's important for us not to only deliver data, deliver story, but to really connect the two and giving them a voice in a way that inspires change. And one man who had a great opportunity to do this uh, lived a couple hundred years ago. His name was Ignaz Semmelweis. And he was in charge of a hospital where um, he had a very serious problem. And his problem was that his patients, these women that would come to deliver their children, um, were dying. And uh, there was this childbed fever that was going around, and it was so bad in one half of the hospital that was in charge, uh, was led by the doctors, that when people found out they were assigned to that part, they would just choose to have their children at home with no help. And he couldn't figure out why it is it was so different, uh, and more, so much more risky on the doctor's side than the midwife's side. And one day he discovered something that was true and valuable and actionable, but unfortunately it was not adopted, and let's, let's learn why. So it started off here. And it's heartbreaking to think about how many families uh, were destroyed from this, this disease. And until one day, uh, Ignaz Semmelweis noticed that one of his friends who was on the doctor's side of the hospital uh, was pricked by a scalpel that he had been using earlier in the morning to do his studies as a doctor and to do an autopsy. And he en ended up dying very quickly by uh, symptoms very similar to childbed fever. So to us, it seems pretty obvious. Oh, of course, there's germs. Uh, but he didn't know about that. No one did at the time. Uh, but he had a theory that potentially it was the smell. So he implemented this policy that doctors would have to wash their hands with chlorine to cover up the smell after they had done their studies. And immediately after they did that, things got significantly better than they had ever been before. And you would think that would be the end of his story. 
He ended up saving a whole bunch of families, and everybody believed in what he said. Unfortunately, he ran into the cultural problem that many of us run into when we try to implement some major change. Um, after the next few months, we, he saw that there were these doctors who would say, doctors are gentlemen, gentlemen's hand, hands are clean, there's no way that we've been to blame all along for all these deaths, and some were breaking the rules, and he decided at that moment that he would really just crack down on them through his authority, rather than motivate and inspire them through a combination of data and visuals and narrative. So even though that worked for a little while, and they even had a few months where there were no deaths at all, uh, after a while, people began to tire of him calling them ignoramuses and just really telling them to do it because he said so, to the point where, unfortunately, he was fired and dismissed from the hospital. And it took many more years before uh, germ theory was dis uh, discovered and they were able to really get to the final solution. And so if I think about why it is that some of I struggled with that, it's the same reason why I sometimes might have a good idea, but it just dies. Uh, going out and presenting that idea to my customers or to my um, teammates uh, takes a lot of effort. Regardless of the different method I might use to, to combine these three keys, I don't always have the time. And so uh, when you combine that with the, the people and process and technology issues that can make that even harder, you'll see that some people just don't consider themselves to be analysts. They uh, hope that it'll just be summed up for them and they don't really understand where the data is coming from. And even though there's a lot of different solutions that Adobe strives to provide to you that are really well integrated, um, there is a learning curve that can take some time to get over. And so what I'm trying to say is that it's not that every bit of work that you've ever done with your clients and your teammates hasn't been acceptable if you haven't followed this data storytelling framework exactly. But what I'm saying is that if you're in a special situation where the idea you've come up with is extremely valuable, but the implementation of that idea is very difficult or very expensive for your team. That is the subset of time when you really need to give a little bit more of yourself. Uh, go above and beyond and make sure you're connecting with people, not only logically but emotionally, to motivate them to consider uh, either buying your product or uh, implementing your change. And it's really this uh, story zone where I re reflect back on Ignaz Semmelweis and try not to learn his mistakes the hard way. And so if you're wondering how it is that maybe you or your team could better avoid those mistakes, there's actually a few surveys that we put together um, where you could answer it within the matter of maybe five or 10 minutes. And depending on your role, whether you're an analyst or a marketer or an advertiser, there's one that's personalized for you. And once you go and you fill out those details, uh, it doesn't just, oh, here, I got the, the phone, oh. Uh. Um, once you check this out, we'll kick back to you um, your results, not only for what you have done, but how you compare to some of your, your peers. And it really focus on these three major building blocks of people and process and technology to motivate you to continue improving and continue learning all the time. And some of the ways that you could actually apply the uh, advice and the insights from those surveys is by understanding the psychology of data storytelling. And so there are a bunch of things uh, that uh, as a husband and as a dad and as a business person uh, that I'm in denial of. And as I really focus on these things, it changes the way that I treat people. And the first one is that I assume that I can get a lot of stuff done at the same time. Um, but really, um, I'm horrible at it, and many of us are. Um, I don't want to ever look at my phone when I'm driving, but sometimes if it buzzes when I'm at a red light, I'm that guy you're honking at because I looked at it when the lights are in green. And uh, I think that much uh, too often that's what happens to us in our client presentations, in our online interactions, and in our business meetings with our coworkers. And if we understand that multitasking is a myth, myth it comes up to us to make sure that we get our message really narrowed down within their attention span. Uh, when I first gave this presentation uh, back at Summit in March, I had the three keys, the data and visuals and narrative, buried way at the end as my punchline, and no one remembered that it was even there. And uh, hopefully, as we kind of have that up earlier in the presentation, that'll be the one thing that you remember uh, when, when this is all over, that those three keys are essential in data storytelling. Um, but even if you, you have a really good hook and you try to land that in the first initial 10 minutes, it's okay to have some sus um, suspense. Uh, one of the goals that I always try to shoot for is to get someone to say, tell me more. And that's uh, a really uh, precious moment where you can go and deliver to them uh, 
the patterns that they can apply to their lives instead of just the details that are just about you and make sure that you're taking advantage of those patterns in a visual way um, that helps them remember what it is that you discussed. And so some of the other reasons why data storytelling is so important both for our teammates and for our clients um, are because it's more memorable. Um, there was a study done by Chip and Dan Heath where they went to a school and they gave a bunch of students uh, a couple different positions that they could take on a criminal justice issue. And it wasn't about which side they chose. It wasn't even how they presented it, but it was how their classmates remember what was said. And unfortunately, even though a small sliver of the, clients, of the students actually shared a story in defending the side that they chose, um, that was really the only thing that their classmates remembered were the stories that uh, helped them really empathize with the people in, in this situation. Um, they went on and continued another study at a different school where they showed how much more persuasive data stories can be. Um, they said, okay, let's take all the numbers and data and logic that was presented in the first study and let's now arm the students with the most beautiful, clear infographic that you've ever seen. I love infographics. I kind of collect them. Uh, I think they're very informative. But unfortunately, even though this infographic was perfect, um, they only received half the donations when they went out and saw uh, sought donations for clean water from the kids in comparison that went out and told the story of a girl named Rakia and how she uh, had to go through all these difficult things just to be able to have this basic human right that many of us enjoy. And so as you're going out and you're trying to figure out how you're trying to motivate your clients and your team, uh, just remember that stories are what are memorable and persuasive. And um, if, if I were you, I might be getting a little defensive at this point. A lot of us are here because we strive to keep learning. We try to be pretty intelligent people, and that logic is a big part of how we justify our existence. And when we think about stories, sometimes it can feel like we're trying to take emotion and have, her that, have that distract us. But that's not what we're uh, trying to say at all. And really, when we look at people who have had injuries where the logical and the emotional part of their brains have somehow been uh, disconnected, um, there was a man named Dr. Antonio Damasio, who tried to study them and see how it is that their lives happened uh, after their injury. And he would just try to make the most basic of appointments with these people, uh, say, let's meet here and let's have lunch there. And he would find that they would spend hours just debating the smallest minutia of the decision. Of, I don't want to go there because it's just a few minutes farther away. I don't want to eat here because it's not quite as healthy or it's something that I had 74 days ago. And so what we're trying to say is that uh, emotion is not the shady side of reason, but it is what balances us. And data storytelling, it's, data storytelling is the bridge that helps take those two very valuable parts of the way that we make decisions and do it in both a smart and in a timely manner. And so a quick example of this is that um, my role at Adobe is I'm a kind of a combination advertiser and analyst. And if I wanted to commit career suicide, I would basically show up as a search specialist and ambush my team and say, OK, social, display, email people. This is the reason with this data uh, on attribution why search rules. And all of you should give, you, give me all of your budget. And I should be able to fund all my campaigns and expand my team. Because right here in this data, it proves that search is the best. And in that situation, uh, hopefully you're kind of thinking the same way that, uh, that everyone else is thinking that, OK, if he shows this information, it's probably not from the correct source, it's probably not complete, it's probably not totally accurate, and so rather than even considering what it is that we're doing to try and improve the customer experience, it becomes a war of words and a bunch of politics. But instead, if we were to back away from that data ambush where we're making people feel stupid, not because they are stupid, but just because uh, we have a greater head start in some situations, and we were to tell a story of what the customer's experience is like, that's when we can set aside any doubts. And people kind of get this curiosity that leads them to consider what the future could be like and what their role could be in that future with you. And so that's why we want to really make sure we help people drop their intellectual guard by looking at this normal path to value and inserting a domino that we hadn't considered as valuable before. For me, I've, I've said a billion times that, OK, yes, we want to have data-driven decisions and go from analytics to decision making. But when we put data storytelling in there, we have a lot less debate, a lot less uh, slow decisions, and a lot more unity with our customer and our teams. And so it's just this one thing that my, my dad said to me. I told him I was kind of nervous about this presentation. And uh, he said to me, just realize that they're not going to remember anything that you say. 
you're going to make a bunch of mistakes, and they're secretly kind of rooting for you, hoping that you don't feel too nervous. But in the end, they're going to remember how you made them feel. And what I hope you feel is that I'm passionate about data storytelling, and I'm passionate about customer experience, and I know that you are because you are too. And together, I believe that we can help each other uh, to help our clients feel how committed we are to giving them a better experience. And so this incredibly awkward picture uh, is the beginning of the journey. And it's a really old movie. Well, not really old. It's not as old as a Rolodex. We'll be talking about that all day. Um, but planes, trains, and automobiles, two men meet uh, coincidentally on a trip and just annoy the crap out of each other. And uh, this is a little bit of their story. I was having a perfectly nice trip until you walked into my life. I walked into your life. Who was that who talked my ear off on the plane? Who was that? I'm curious. Well, who told you to book a room? I did out of the goodness of my dumb old heart. Boy, you're an ungrateful jackass. Well, go ahead, sleep in the lobby, see if I care. I hope you wake up so stiff you can't even move. You're no saint. You got a free cab, you got a free room. And someone who'll listen to your boring stories. I mean, didn't you, didn't you notice on the plane when you started talking, eventually I started reading a vomit bag? Didn't that give you some sort of clue, like, hey, maybe this guy's not enjoying it? You know, everything is not an anecdote. You have to discriminate. You choose things that are, that are funny or, or mildly amusing or interesting. You're a miracle. Your stories have none of that. They're not even amusing accidentally. Honey, I'd, li I'd like you to meet Del Griffith. He's got some amusing anecdotes for you. Oh, and here's a gun so you can blow your brains out. You'll thank me for it. <sighs> I, I, I could tolerate any, any insurance seminar. For days, I could sit there and listen to them go on and on with a big smile on my face. And I'd say, how can you stand it? And I'd say, because I've been with Del Griffith. I can take anything. And you know what they'd say? They'd say, I know what you mean. The shower curtain ring guy. Whoa. It's, it's like going on a date with a chatty Kathy doll. I expect you to have a little string on your chest, you know, that I pull out and have to snap back. Except I wouldn't pull it out and snap it back. You would. And by the way, you know, when you're, when you're telling these little stories, here's a good idea. Have a point. It makes it so much more interesting for the listener. So as John Candy is standing there just getting destroyed by Steve Martin, I realize I am John Candy. <laughs> and I love stories. Like, I sometimes I'll listen to This American Life just so I have a story to tell in an awkward social situation. But it's important for us to make sure that there's a point. And um, really, as we get past that main section, it just shows that we need to put the audience first. And often after you have that point and people say those magic words of tell me more, we have another choice to make. We can do what's easy, which is just to be descriptive and tell people in general who and what, but very rarely are people interested in the answers to those questions. The vast majority of the time, they want explanatory because explanatory insights and background is what leads to the prescriptive and the action. And really, it starts to focus on the why and the how question. You know, a lot of you have probably heard of Simon Sinek. If you haven't, checked out his TED Talk. He talks about this book, Start With Why, and I love it. And you can see a lot of the reason why that's the most important explanatory question to begin with. And uh, the reason why this is so important is because there's pressure on all of us. Whether you're the executive or you're the team, we're all trying to figure out how to be better than we were last year. And way too many of us are still stuck in this descriptive mode, even with all the tools that we have available to us. And only when we focus on the why and how question will we be able to get into the advanced diagnostic and the, pre and the prescriptive. And so another way that we can think about this is about not just the events, but the relationships between the events. Because really, is that not the definition of a story? The relationships between uh, our decisions and w between each other? I haven't watched The Wizard of Oz for years and years and years, but just glancing at these few icons, I can remember exactly what happens in every part of the story. And that's because the relationship between each of those events was so strongly connected and so well told. And so when you're in a meeting and you, in a, and you ask yourself, how is the thing that we discussed a few minutes related to what we're about to do? Um, I think that kind of explains the reason why when someone says to you the word meeting, no one says, yay, meeting. And it's important for us to get some, some fun and interaction and emotion into what we do by showing the relationship with each other and with the events we're talking about. Another great example of this and in following Steve Martin's advice of you have to discriminate, you have to limit things down to the parts that are most important are uh, the narrative elements in the, just the first few minutes of Up. 
Uh, if you haven't seen the movie, it's a story of two people that fall in love, grow old together, and, and try to keep their promises to each other. And uh, even if you haven't seen the movie for a long time, I think that you can agree with me that uh, those first two, three minutes could have easily justified being its own two or three hour movie. Um, but even though a lot was told in a short amount of time, it was memorable because they did a great job discriminating to the things worth uh, looking at and talking about. And so Michael Donnelly, again, I think did a great job talking about how story is an essential part of the human experience. We're not robots, and thank goodness for that. They're never going to take our jobs. Um, and that's because we're able to come in and also give people uh, visuals that align with what we're trying to say. Uh, I had an English teacher that she would always give me uh, marks off on what I wrote because I would tell and tell and tell and she would ask me to show. And that's a lot what Mark Twain tried to encourage us to do with our visuals. And instead of just saying what happened, allow the visuals to speak for themselves. And so let's start real quick with some of these keys and what should be our strengths. We're all here because we're pretty good at data. And the problem with that is we're almost too good. We get so focused in this explanatory, enlightening attitude that we imagine that we're Indiana Jones. And it's not as glamorous to come away from that field archaeologist that's an explorer and an adventurer and imagine the Dr. Jones side of us that we need to be sometimes like this. And the problem with that is that when we're in the Indiana Jones attitude, we're being kind of selfish. We're doing things because we're familiar with it and because we have the tools that we need to move along and we're just messing around. We don't know what the end of the story will be and we're exploring and making accidents and recovering from them and that's what, uh, that's what we love. But that can be so addictive that when it time, it's time to shift gears and to be a little bit more selfless, uh, we need to remember that we are not the hero and we are not the audience. And then we need to put our customer's experience for, first and our teammates' uh, needs first. And only then can we make the right attitude in helping them catch up with some of the head start that we have, really focus on those few points that matter the most, and make sure it's not just a bunch of information, but a true story that can motivate them to a, a different world. And so one of the best ways that we can do that is just get away from the numbers for a little while. Um, you can tell someone who's really good with the Adobe Marketing Cloud uh, by the way that they act towards totals and averages. They know that they lie, and they try to dig into the details behind those totals and averages to pivot and break down and subrelate things to find out what the truth really is. And so that's one way, place where you can begin is segment your information and find that small segment of your audiences that are most valuable to you. And then augment that uh, with more details around their persona. I used to think that a persona was just a weird thing that user interface designers did. Uh, but really, it could be something that all of us apply to really make sure that we know who we're interacting with and giving these customer, customers the experience they deserve. And then it might seem cheesy, but often just giving them uh, a little a bit of a face that people can connect with and empathize with. Uh, we learned that as well, um, that it's important for us to be able to feel like people are people and to go and look at their true words. Um, the first day on the job I had as a product manager, my teammate... Uh, and I were having this conversation, and I was trying to impress him. And he says to me, your opinion, although interesting, is irrelevant. And he shot me down until basically I was able to come back to him with real comments from our actual customers so that we could focus on their experience instead of my assumptions. So whether that comes from social media or, or surveys or just direct interaction with them, uh, just remember that nothing important happens in the office. Go and get out there with your customers and find out what they really need. And then you're able to so much better put yourself in their shoes, go through their experience, and make sure that you can find out which bottlenecks are really uh, making them struggle uh, in having the type of experience you want to give them. So uh, here's, here's a way in which uh, Lego actually experienced that. Uh, the heroes that they put into their story instead of their customers were their actual characters that they sold. And they just tried to show a very simple problem in a way that could motivate um, some significant change. So as I glance at this landing page, there's nothing that really jumps out to me as horrible or, or poorly designed. But the thing that they were struggling with was the difference between this global navigation that they had and this uh, mini site navigation that they had. And they found out that when people got confused by the global navigation, it wasn't just a minor distraction, but that a vast majority of people were being funneled off to a part of the site that was never intended. And when those 40% of people were distracted, they began to comment and say, take my money, please. Um, but I don't know how to give you uh, what you want for me to get more Legos. 
And when they went out and they just compared that section of the site's issue versus the site average, they were able to project what the potential loss was if they were not responding to this issue. And in this way, they're able to take all five of those essential elements of data storytelling and not only in motivate their teams to try something different, but stay focused on the customer experience. And uh, one thing that stood out to me here is that when I think about visuals, I think about Excel and Adobe Analytics and Tableau maybe, and really getting into the most perfect chart or graph that's out there. But in this example, they just really focused on keeping themselves uh, in the customer's shoes. So moving on to narrative now, this is probably the area where I would estimate we are the weakest in general as a group. And that's because we can't really get past this point. I think we've all kind of had this look. Fortunately, no, none of you are giving it to me right now. Uh, but we've got to give people a reason to care, whether they're our customers or our teammates. And it really comes down to us getting to know them. And I don't know how many of you have ever been in a meeting where someone actually came and interviewed you one-on-one -on -one before that happened. Um, but I was really grateful that before the symposium happened, I was able to do that in a small degree uh, through some of the registrations that you, you had. Um, I had intended for this to be a very tactical, technical, practitioner type of session. Um, well, I saw that many of you are uh, senior managers or directors or even VPs. And even though I know there are some pro practitioners in here, uh, it's important for us to be able to make sure we, we know what the audience wants the most and to adjust to that. And uh, even if your, your content is really good, uh, no one's going to really care unless you, they know that you've changed it for them. And so you might be thinking, okay, well then how do I change it? I have this, these findings, it took me forever to find them, and I think they're important for us to present, um, but how do I actually turn that into a story that's personalized for my audience? Uh, fortunately, Gustav Freitag answered that question a couple hundred years ago. And he uh, proved that there is a universal structure to any compelling story that we would tell. And it starts off with just the shortest runway possible. We're just trying to get off the ground, help people become familiar with our situation, just enough context to understand why we should care, but then as soon as possible, moving into the hook. And the hook is that major conflict or problem or opportunity where we need to really look at things in a different way. And then here we have that John Candy problem. We have a hundred different things that we could talk about, but we need to narrow it down to just the very best three or four rising insights that lead us finally to the most important insight of all, that main aha moment where we say this. This is the thing that's going to make people want to say, tell me more. This is the thing that's going to make our customers want to say, take my money. And uh, that aha moment is often for, um, forgotten and people are just dropped off at this cliffhanger when instead what we could do is begin focusing on uh, the solution, their involvement in applying the solution, and the benefits of, of living happily ever after. And so in this structure of just four main pieces or so, we can really look at the way that we're presenting things and make sure that we have all of our bases covered in this universal uh, story arc. So here, uh, here's the first problem, though. We might experience it as we're going through it as one, two, three, four, but no one gives a crap about one or two. And so we need to kind of jump to level three where we say, okay, here's that aha moment, here's the th this thing about why you should care, and then we can back in after that to give them confidence that our information is reliable based on the original problem that we observed and the data that backed up this decision that we're proposing and uh, reminding them that we're really focusing on the benefit for the team and for our customers' experience. So even though there are different questions that we could ask here and different tools that can help us, um, one of the interesting things that someone said to me after I first gave this presentation was, okay, where in the Adobe Marketing Cloud does narrative happen? I know where I can go for data, I know where I can go to, for visuals, but what part of your solution solves my narrative problem? And I think that it's important for us to, to watch out for a moment with this pitfall of confusing the tool with the task and rem remembering why it is that you deserve to be uh, in this beautiful place right now. And it's that the narrative truly is up to you and almost always will be. And that as we look at automation as just uh, an acceleration or an augmentation of what you do, uh, narrative is what justifies um, our control over the machines. And so with that in mind, here's a quick example. Let's say that I was a retailer and I could say a whole bunch of different things. But the thing that's gonna make my boss say tell me more is if we were to do a new promotion today that we've never done before, I believe that we could make an incremental $600,000. That's gonna get the person's attention. 
And so hopefully they'll say, well, how do you know that? And you can back up into that now and say, well, it's because when I looked at our year-over-year -year, uh, volumes for, for this date, uh, we saw that last time there was a seasonal uh, activity that's going on that really causes our customers to act more than they usually do. And then they might say, okay, well, what am I supposed to do about that? And you could say, well, in this specific focus, uh, we realize that there's many levers to pull, but in the Pareto principle of the 80-20 rule, a small minority of things is going to push the majority of our performance. So I think we should really focus on foot, uh, footwear and specifically do it in email because um, we see that that's the greatest channel where people respond to that product type. And so a lot of us probably have shared these four points or similar four points like this in other meetings or tried to help our clients experience the same thing. Uh, but it's often just the structure and the sequence of it uh, that can help us to be a little bit more successful in the future. And so I'm sure that you've been to other communication training or public speaking seminars or even sales training, and they'll all have different magical words that are going to solve your data storytelling problem. And what I've actually found comforting is that even though there's different vocabulary around this, the structure is still true. It's still universally significant, even though there might be different ways of describing it. And so this is my favorite part of the whole presentation because this man right here is who I want to be for Halloween. His name is Hans Rosling. If you haven't seen him, you've got to check him out. So incredibly interesting and fun. Uh, he's a scientist in Europe, and he delivers what I consider to be the greatest visualization of all time. Visualization is right at the heart of my own work, too. I teach global health. And I know having the data is not enough. I have to show it in ways people both enjoy and understand. Now, I'm going to try something I've never done before, animating the data in real space with a bit of technical assistance from the crew. So, here we go. First, an axis for health. Life expectancy from 25 years to 75 years. And down here, an axis for wealth, income per person, 400, 4,000, and $40,000. So down here is poor and sick, and up here is rich and healthy. Now, I'm going to show you the world 200 years ago in 1810. Here come all the countries. Europe brown, Asia red, Middle East green, Africa south of Sahara blue, and the Americas yellow. And the size of the country bubble showed the size of the population. And in 1810, it was pretty crowded down there, wasn't it? All countries were sick and poor. Life expectancy were below 40 in all countries. And only the UK and the Netherlands were slightly better off, but not much. And now, why start the world? The Industrial Revolution makes countries in Europe and elsewhere move away from the rest. But the colonized countries in Asia and Africa, they are stuck down there. And eventually, the Western countries get healthier and healthier. And now, we slow down to show the impact of the First World War and the Spanish flu epidemic. What a catastrophe. What a catastrophe. I love that guy. That video is awesome. You can watch every minute of it. Please, go check it out. But what I love about it is he knows that even though I have the data, I need to present it in a way that people enjoy and understand. And that's what visuals do. Uh, for example, we're supposed to be pretty smart people. Uh, tell me what this data means. All I know is there's a whole bunch of eights over there on that one side. Um, but when we visualize Anscombe's Quartet, what this is based on, we can see not only the relationship between all those numbers, but begin to infer how the relationship will probably continue into the future. And that's why I believe that visualizations give us answers uh, to questions we didn't even know that we had. And that's all based on our survival, both in life and in business and giving people a good experience. And so what it comes down to is the different chunks of our brain. We have this part that we want to be friendly with, this system one that's smart and instinctive and, and really agile. And unfortunately, we have uh, the other side that usually gets in our way. It's slow and tries to control and organize everything. And so if we can focus on the correct visualization, we keep things on autopilot, we keep the conversation moving forward, we keep things intuitive and natural, and we avoid the lazy controller that can really slow things down. And here's a quick example of this. Um, when we glance at this information without visualization, we could say, okay, yeah, bat in the ball, that's a dollar more, so if that's combined together, I take a dollar out of it, boom, there's the answer. 
That's what I thought when I first saw this. But really, if you think about it a little bit farther, no, that's not quite right. With visualization, it would have been a lot easier for us to see the correct answer to this simple problem. And many times when we just look at the piles of spreadsheets and junk that can be shoved at us, uh, we can make the wrong decision without this type of guidance. And so another way that we can help uh, both our teammates and our customers have a better experience is by making things easier for them. Uh, make the load that we're putting on their understanding a lot easier. Even if there's a really difficult intrinsic load, which means something's just difficult no matter what we do about it. Or that it's gotten uh, a bunch of extraneous distractions or the germane or basically the organization of it's really complex. Uh, we can take uh, these options within the Adobe Marketing Cloud to help our decisions around improving the customer experience become a lot easier. So um, if you've ever looked at Omniture, Site Catalyst, or Reports and Analytics, or whatever you want to call it before, um, probably what comes to mind for you is a lot of options and a lot of green spinning circles. And uh, I just wanted to emphasize today as one of the slightly more tactical practitioner takeaways that the world has changed. That a lot of times we'll try and push out incremental minor improvements, and that's just the nature of product management. But in this new world of uh, analysis workspaces, I promise that whether you are a really experienced analyst or whether you're a higher level managing business user, these new analysis workspaces are something you can learn with no training. And here's a couple things to back up my claim there. First thing is that it's drag and drop. And I think about the world of, of the way I want to interact with um, information these days. I don't want to go through a, a sea of drop down boxes and a bunch of Excel spreadsheets. I want to be able to just make a mistake, recover from that mistake, just by dragging things onto the screen where I want them to be. Uh, the next thing is that a lot of times there will be a different excuse. Oh, you have to use this, this version of the product or use this workaround or this trick to be able to get past the averages that lie. But that's not the way that it works anymore. If you want to see what caused a total or an average to happen, you can pivot and drill down and break down as much as you want. My record so far is, is 12 pivots before I ran out of screen real estate. Uh, the next thing is visualizations. You know, a lot of things that, like if you ask my grandma what I did, she would say, though, he messes around in Excel all day long. And um, I think that a lot of us have a really strange statistic uh, addiction to Excel. And it's not bad. I just say use it when you have to. And uh, if you're the type of person who kind of cringes when you think about getting data out and in and formatted and lined up in the right way, uh, these visualizations and the analysis workspace can do the vast majority of what you'd be doing in other systems, but keeps it in one, uh, one place, one web interface without having to install anything and really help you move on to your action. And then the other thing I love about this is when I think about any system, um, whether it's Media Optimizer or Analytics or Target or Campaign Experience Manager, they all have reports. And all of those reports answer one question, but usually I have many more than one question. And so what I like about this layout is I can answer everything about a certain problem in one place. And so analytics truly starts to become a place where I don't just go to get my on-site behavior and performance activity, but I go and I take all of the data from the other solutions, media optimizer, experience manager, audience manager, and I consume it in this new workspace. And so what happens usually after that is the question of, well, how do I get it out and how do I share it with my team? And usually they're asking for some sort of Excel or PowerPoint or PDF. And what I consider to be different between a dashboard and a workspace is that a dashboard is static, and it's that thing that your boss puts on auto-delete after you work on it for 17 hours, and the novelty is worn off and he doesn't care about it anymore. But a workspace is a place where they can go in and even as a business user, do a little bit of interaction and see what things reveal, uh, reveal themselves. But the problem with that is you're never going to go and take a big workspace with a whole bunch of options where your boss could shoot him in the foot unless you can curate. And so much like a, a museum curator that simplifies and selects and narrows things down to the most important parts, you can just take the few options that you would like your team to be able to interact with and curate them in a way that it's still interactive and collaborative for them. And then if you're really dying to put it into a PDF and email it, you can do that uh, and schedule it if you like. So an example of how, in real life, uh, a customer of ours used these functions to be able to improve the customer experiences in CDW. So CDW is B2B computers, basically. And uh, so what they did is they took advantage of anomaly detection. And they found out that on a certain day, there was significantly higher revenue than there usually is. 
And then they took advantage of contribution analysis to answer the, the why question. And they found out that it was this one specific product that drove most of the revenue that day. Um, as they went in and they drilled down and remember that averages lie, they found out when they, they did the pivot on that, that one customer drove the vast majority of revenue for that one product on that one day. And so uh, as a media optimizer advertising guy, my hope is, oh, we can magically apply some sort of bidding and budgeting and media mix modeling al algorithm to replicate that magic again in the future. But that's not what CDW did. They realized that some things just can't be fixed with bidding and budgeting, and they focused on the customer experience. They reached out directly to this customer and said, hey, thank you for this, uh, this, this order. We can see that you have a major need here. Anything that we can do for you in the future to help you find related products or make this order simpler for you in the future, here's a special line for customer service to make sure that we show you our commitment as a strategic partner. And that's what they really were able to do to replicate that magic in the future. And so um, one way that you can get started on that is just by really being obsessive about new versus return uh, segments within your data. Um, making sure that as you are committed to giving those return loyal um, customers the experience that they deserve, uh, you can make sure that what you show them from then on um, does not suffer from amnesia and that you remember the great things that they had done with you in the past and you can give them in the future a compelling and useful experience. So here's how Adobe does that. Uh, we try to make sure that what we make and manage and measure is all combined into one workflow. And when we're selling uh, Creative Cloud, for example, let's pretend that we have a student who's going out trying to figure out how they can get access to the Creative Cloud at a price that a student could afford. They'll search for it, try and figure out just the simple question, uh, how much does it cost? As they go in and land at Adobe, after a general search, they're going to get a general landing page with general pricing. And unfortunately, that's the, uh, the, the beginning place where many of us have to start. But that's not where we end. Um, as the uh, visitor goes around and interacts with the adobe.com site, we're keeping track in analytics of what parts of the site sections they're really interested in. And they're not just letting that rot away in a silo, but we're passing that off into Media Optimizer where in search, social, and display, as that student continues his homework, we'll see an ad that reminds them that we're grateful for that interaction they'd have with us in the past. So even if they don't buy right away because they can't afford 30 or $40 a month, if they come back and continue to show signs of intent and context, uh, we make sure that that continues to be shared out across the marketing cloud. So if they were to go out and specifically dig a little bit deeper the second time about saying, no, I'm, I don't want it for enterprises, I want it for students, we can make sure that they then qualify for a totally different audience segment than they began in the, in the beginning. And to show that this isn't smoke and mirrors, uh, what happens is we can take a look at the universal uh, user ID that appears when someone interacts with our site in this deeper type of way. And we can take that user ID, and whether we're in Media Optimizer or Audience Manager or in Target, be able to go in and say, this audience definition is consistent across all of those solutions and across all of those channels. So let's make sure that that customer journey is personalized in a way that shows our gratitude for their, um, for their engagement with us. So that when in the future, if they continue to go on and do that homework, instead of just having a general Creative Cloud ad, they now see a student's ad. They see it's a greater promotion for them. Uh, they see that we are not being creepy, but we're being personalized and relevant. And even if they were to do a general search through um, some of the newer features like remarketing lists, we're able to give them a more personalized ad, even off of a general keyword, and make sure that the landing pages they see, even if they just type in our um, homepage directly, is still personalized to that student experience so that we can finally get them to that uh, last magic moment uh, where we uh, get the conversion and we're able to start building our relationship with them in the long term. And so, that's just one way in real life that our internal Adobe marketing team tries to give people a better experience through a combination of analytics and media optimizer and audience manager. And um, I hope that uh, you'll come in and meet with me after uh, this is over and we can talk about how this could come uh, true in real life for you. Um, I know that each of the solutions are sometimes uh, easy to, to, for, to define and to remember exactly what their role is. And uh, I wasn't planning on doing this, but I kind of get the feeling that I should. If I were to just give a one word use case to each of the solutions in the marketing cloud, uh, this is it off the top of my head. So analytics, of course, is uh, measurement. Uh, media optimizer is advertising. 
Uh, experience manager is content and CMS. Audience manager is your DMP or your data management platform to be able to really define audiences and collect all their traits. Um, social is their, your monitoring, a little bit different from the paid ads. And then prime time is, is of course our video with campaign following in the end with uh, email and, and text. And so if that's helpful in any way, I hope that you can come and whether you're interacting with any of those parts of the marketing cloud, we're happy to help you. And just remember that as you combine data and visuals and narrative uh, together, those stories are truly things that can change your organization and change the world. So that's my time. <laughs> Target, did I not say it? Target's testing and more in personalization. Shit. <laughs> <laughs>